pricing normally, you know, when you talk about pricing, people's eyes kind of glaze over and they think, wow, how boring. The last thing most people want to think about in the world is price because usually it's too high. And um, in fact, when I work with companies, you find the opposite, that uh, oftentimes uh, the price is too low. So what I'm hoping here, my goal today uh, is three things. The first thing is that uh, you come away and you think about the difference between cost, price, and value, uh, which sounds subtle, but actually uh, they mean entirely different things depending on which side of the selling equation you're on and what you're trying to do with it. The second thing is I hope you come away uh, with a view that as you look around you, we are going through one of the biggest disruptions in pricing itself, uh, and pricing is at the core of the economy because it's basically what happens when something gets sold and there's a transaction. Uh, and the third thing is I hope you can go to a cocktail party and when people say disruptive pricing or disruptive innovation, you can nod and actually know because uh, as we were talking before the session, so often you hear this word disruptive and actually very few people know what it means. Everybody just kind of nods, oh, that's very disruptive. Uh, so what, what I'm going to do here is I want to start thinking about price contextually. And this is closely paired with the revolution we've seen over the last 10 years in mobile devices, specifically smartphones. The idea here is that actually disruptive pricing is jumping off the screen and out of the tablet and off the phone and into the world around you. So as we move forward from here, what you're going to see is prices in the real world that start acting more like the prices you see online. Now, whether that's a good thing or not, uh, once again, depends on your perspective. So before anything else, uh, we have the most important question. It's a hard question. Uh, it's a meme that went around last year, and it's, how should a dog wear pants? Like this or like this? And uh, I'd just like to keep you to keep this question in mind because um, the second question is, how much would he pay for them? And the third question is, where would he buy them? Or you, uh, instead of him. Now, when we get into value, price, cost, uh, this is the equation that I think works very well. So over here we have customers, and customers have value, and value is very different from price because value represents experience and price. So you pay for something in a monetary value, this is rational, this is emotional, the customer has them together as a single thing. So if you look at your iPhone, you say, man, I love this thing. It's $500, but I love it. So I love it, it's $500. Now, we get down here, which is, this is $500, and on the top we have the margin, which is what Apple takes and runs away with, and there we have the cost. The cost comes to the transformations of the inputs, right? So when we talk about pricing and value, we have an entire chain from what the customer is getting out of it at the end, how they're using it, what it means to them, all the way to the other side, where the suppliers provide inputs, the company transforms, they have a cost, they make a margin, that's the brand, and all the way back through. And a good example is the iPhone. This is the iPhone success. Apple's cost is 211 uh, US dollars. Uh, the price is 550, which gives them a margin of 339, 60%. Now, uh, the average business large cap on stock exchange in the United States is about 6%. So you can see that Apple's doing something right. Well, then we have the experience. So this is uh, the experience of the iPhone. And more importantly, we have the value. And so if you look at this chain, if you're the user, this is what you want. You want the ability to put a silly crown on and then somebody to throw up back at you, especially rainbows. Now we're gonna get into a case study, uh, and this is quite a deep dive. In the last 10 years, what we've seen is Amazon. And Amazon disrupted uh, pricing in a very particular way, and it's actually a very simple way. So they moved from distribute and sell to sell and distribute. Now, most retailers, they distribute and then they sell. So a shopkeeper orders 500 iPhones, put them in the shop, and then they try to sell them. They discount them, they, you know, they offer promotions, they offer coupons, anything along that variety. And Jeff Bezos simply said, what happens if we sold it first and then distributed it? We wouldn't have to deal with things like waste. We could actually get better discriminatory pricing. And so, 10, you know, 10 years in, 20 years in, uh, you see the effect. American retailers are closing stores faster than ever, and down there you see Amazon is gobbling up most of the industry, but actually, 
It's more than Amazon. Why retail is in distress now. So within 20 years, and we'll see an example later how this is 20 years out of 2,000, Amazon has come in and literally changed the entire retail model to the point where it's causing major economic disruptions in the United States, also in Europe, and now probably in India as well. Before my current company, I ran a company called We Are Pop-Up. And We Are Pop-Up was a pop-up retail site uh, built kind of in the Airbnb ethos. And the reason was we had all of these shops in England, all these beautiful shops uh, that were empty. It was after the financial crisis. And the financial crisis hit retail very hard. It was estimated at the peak that one out of seven shops in the UK was empty. And so we looked at that and we said, well, basically what's happened here is customers have lost value. Now, as we go through this talk, you're gonna see you're, the suppliers over here, so the real estate and the landlords, they're over here, they're quite far away from that. They're not really seeing it yet. So the financial crisis begins here. This is the vacancy rate, so this is a percent of shops that are empty. So if you're a landlord, this is the percent of your shops that aren't paying you any rent, they're sitting on your books, they're dead weight, you have to take care of them, and you're not making any money from them. So the financial crisis kicks in, and we go from a little over 5% all the way up near to 15 in about two years. This is a massive disruption because this is jobs lost, this is tax revenue lost. And so we saw that and we saw it even out. So the financial crisis in a lot of sectors started tailing here and actually the economy recovered. Not in retail, in retail it remained. And so we launched We Are Pop-Up in roughly April 2012. Uh, and the model was quite simple. So meet brands, find space, build relationships. Uh, we worked with places like this. This is a pop-up mall in the Shoreditch area of England, of uh, London. And basically, these are pop-up brands, so there are no long-term leases. People get in, in and out of these shops really easy. They're built in shipping containers. Uh, with food brands, we worked with a place called Dinorama. Uh, this is essentially the evolution of the food truck. Uh, and what we did was, these are micro-retail spaces. They're very easy to get into. They're very low cost. People could build businesses on the back of them. And wow, people were so interested in the beginning. These were unique visitors across three of the platforms that launched that year. Two million registered users, 10,000 were doing well. We got a 5% conversion rate. Inquiries, 60,000, 60%. People are really interested. No contracts. So what happened? Lots of interest. People love retail, right? People love retail. People love shopping. People need shopping. People don't want to do it online. But you see the conversion rate was quite low. Well, what we would find out is actually the problem wasn't the rent, and the problem wasn't the space. The problem was Amazon. So we started there, we go for a few years. We sold it last year because it was not venture scale. So we thought this thing was gonna be like Airbnb, launched like a rocket ship. Um, it didn't, and so we sold it on. What happened? Amazon happened. Basically, if we go back uh, over about 15 years of retail history, these are Harvard Business Review sections. So in 2001, Harvard Business Review filed under marketing, said the key is to focus on the total customer experience. So basically, your shop needs to be your brand, and you get the Apple Store. 2006, they say, the era of standardization is ending. Every retail store has to be unique and offer an emotional value proposition and connect with the customer in a different way. Under financial management, this is the Nike store, it's the Nike 1943 store in the London borough Shoreditch. And once again, it's customized. There's no other Nike store like this, and you see this with a lot of Nike stores. They're all, they're all unique, they're all individual, they're all trying to participate in theater. Then in 2011, you have retail isn't broken, stores are. So you can see, we're trying to fix retail, but actually, wh what we're doing isn't working. So brand didn't work, and now customization didn't work. So actually, we're saying, stores are broken, and this is under change management, so now you need to change your business. And finally, in 2016, Instagram launches their Shop Now button, and we decide actually we don't need the store. We don't need the store anymore, so the phone is the store, which uh, I do quite enjoy the fact that in the beginning, there's Apple, there's the iPhone, so the phone is sold in the store, and then the phone becomes a store. And this is filed under business models, there's too much physical real estate. Now when we look at disruption, why does this happen? So Amazon has an unassailable advantage. The efficiencies that Amazon are finding cannot be matched. Target is a major US retailer, 35% more expensive than Amazon. Which way are people gonna go? 
This is a, a UK comparison. These are different grocery stores. This is how much more expensive than Amazon they are. The cheapest low-end grocery store, 15% more than Amazon. And on this side, they have the best deal on laundry detergent, 20 cents, 22 cents, 14 cents. So this is two countries, different categories. Amazon wins in all of them. How does it do that? Well, in retail we've seen, so this is gone because actually people, people don't want generic retail stores. Now, Amazon's come in and they said, well, we're gonna give you a better experience because you can shop from home, you can shop from your phone and it's lower price. So now we've gone from the customer, now we're affecting the brand. So now actually the brands are being it, the suppliers are still over there. And this is what I was saying before, when you start to think about price, you start to think about ecosystems. Just because you're over there doesn't mean you're immune. Uh, so what's happening here? Well, the first thing is these are production prices of different goods. So these are what Americans are spending money on. And you can see televisions are getting very cheap, computers are getting very cheap, phones are very cheap, cell phone services a little less cheap, cars, clothing, basically anything manufactured is getting cheaper. And so therefore it's getting lower margins, it's getting less expensive and you can make less money off it. Uh, the other interesting thing, if you go this way, you see services start getting more expensive. Why? So this is a Walmart, and if you look at this, this is retail space. This is physical retail space. It has a cost attached. This is Amazon's retail space. What they pay? Walmart pays on average $15 to $30 per square foot. Amazon, which is not in city centers, and it's not where people can go and park and connect with the shop, is five to 10. So it's one third lower cost for, the re for Amazon as a retailer. And we see that reflected in the numbers. Walmart, it's much bigger than Amazon, but if you look at sales per square foot of space, Amazon is more than double. Now this is disruptive, because this actually, Walmart is losing its ability to compete with Amazon. Furthermore, per employee, Amazon's also making twice as much money. Now this is a British version. This is BHS, they went bankrupt last year. If you think about a traditional retail store, what a traditional retail store is a warehouse. This is in the middle of London. It probably costs 120 pounds a square foot, and it's a warehouse because you go in, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, so I have to have a warehouse in the middle of the city that I'm paying high rent on. What if it doesn't sell? Then there's the website, and the website looks like a website. Now we go to Amazon. This is Amazon's warehouse. It's outside the city center. It's connected to the customer via delivery vehicles, yet the website doesn't look entirely different, right? I go on, I click, I buy things. The difference is they don't have a store right in the middle of town costing them a huge amount of money and maybe or maybe not selling things. They have a giant warehouse somewhere it costs them one third the price and they ship things. In the UK, the, because it's a more concentrated market, the numbers are even more exacerbated. So Tesco is one of the UK's largest retailers and you see there the sales per employee of Amazon are now 4X. So actually, as the space gets smaller, the advantages increase. Why is this happening? Well, this is Trajan's market in Rome. It's 2,000 years old. And basically, this was where everybody went to enjoy the proceeds of the Roman Empire. They say all roads lead to Rome. The Romans built an amazing network of roads, and they brought things in from around the empire, and they sold them here. So these are the little shops. They loaded them from the back. The customer came in from the front. There were two levels. 2,000 years later, we have this in Florida, and it looks exactly the same. You have shops, things are loaded in from the back, there's two floors. So in 2,000 years, retail innovated how much? Then, this is down the road, uh, I forget the name of it, um, I think it's Palladium. So this is recently built, this is new, and it looks a lot like that, right? So we're still building this. Like today, we are still building this. Now this is a luxury mall and it's quite nice, and we'll come back to that later. But we're still building this shape and format when the reality is, so this is a rank of sectors based on a profitability metric. And so retail, 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 81, 82, 83. Any guesses where e-commerce comes in? Number one. And now where are they going? Okay, so actually you'll talk to it It'll go to one of their data centers. Now this is, this is their store, this is their front end. So their front end costs $100. Their data center is infinitely scalable and actually when they're not using it, they'll sell it to you. This is their shop floor. 
uh, cost them one-third of what it costs the other guys. And this, this is what they're going to do eventually. So actually, these are all low cost. Uh, and now they're actually introducing a shop, which is ironic, but it's called Amazon Go. And actually, it's said to be so easy, people are making a meme out of it, which is called Amazon Steal. Because actually, literally, you just pick things up off the shelf, it comes out of your Amazon account. Um, now, now we're really getting into the brand, right? So now we're hitting margin and cost quite heavily. We're hitting margin and cost to a point where retailers can't compete. So over here, this is where we started seeing the empty shops. Customers just didn't value the retail experience. Then we saw that actually Amazon could compete much better on price. Now they can't even compete on margin. So what can e-commerce do that retail can't? I mean, what, what, what's the obvious difference? Well, it's much lower cost, and more importantly, you get dynamic pricing. And an example of this, I'll give you a book about dynamic pricing. This is a book about multi-sided marketplaces and platforms. Uh, it's an amazing book. It talks all about pricing. It talks all about how these platforms are evolving. And you can buy it on Amazon. Now, what can Amazon do that other retailers can't? Well, first of all, they will sell it to you. So you can buy it new, 23, 24. It's on sale. So actually, when you go to a bookstore, it has a list price. And so list price is printed on the back of the book, the price is the price. Amazon says, well, no, you know, we want to sell more of them, so actually we're going to lower the price. Well, you say, you know, I heard about this at a conference. Maybe it's not worth that much. Oh, I like this. I can get it used, $16.59. So I'm going to go here. So this is actually the Amazon marketplace, which is if you don't want to buy it new, you can buy it from somebody else's warehouse. So what they're doing is they're getting you either way. You can either pay their price or you can pay somebody else's price, but they're sitting in the middle of the transaction. And that is dynamic pricing because it, they will find how much you want to spend related to this book. And with that, retail has been upended, turned over, and left outside. So now through all of this, now over here we have real estate. And everybody loves real estate because real estate seems, seems valuable. It's like, oh, I own a house. You know, things are real, this is real money. And these are the landlords. And the landlords, they're down here, and they tr basically transform land into store. And they're, they're not having any of it. They're just like, well, this is retail's problem. This isn't a property problem. Oh no, you now have an empty mall. This is e-commerce, and this is offline sales. If we go back to 1995, at the beginning of Amazon, this is per capita UK spend, and you can see it increases at the rate of inflation 3% a year. Only, we start to get a separation here. You say, oh, well, that's where we are now. That's 12%. That's not really that much, is it? 12%. Don't know what that means. But hey, look, retail's fine. Retail's absolutely great. OK. Well, actually, if you notice, all of the gains are going online. So actually, traditional retail, and this is why the vacancy graph flattened out, traditional retail offline is sailing along. And actually, all the gains are being taken online to the point where we can say we have peak offline retail in about 2020. Now, this is going to be a serious problem if you own retail space. And if we put it in proportion of retail spending, so here's where we are today, 11.5%, and this is linear. So if this growth curve accelerates, there's going to be even more pain sooner. But you know, if you look at this, this is 20 years to get to 12%, then we got five years for the next 10%, then over the next 10 years, it takes a third. Now, if you own retail real estate, all of a sudden you're thinking, well, actually, what's my real estate worth? Well, this is the number of square feet in the UK, so there's roughly 1.7 billion square feet, which is too much. And you can see that as e-commerce comes on, it starts moving space into excess use. So what we're looking at is by 2030, which isn't that far away, given the timeline, by 2030, 40% of the retail space in the UK will be excess. If you're an offline landlord, that's how much growth you have left. So that's where you are today, you're roughly there, you have that. So are you gonna get into this industry right now? Well, you might because people love real estate and they think real estate's infallible. If you're e-commerce, this is how much of the market you've captured so far, nothing. And actually you see all the growth is being taken up by e-com. Now what this actually means is if you continue the growth of retail real estate, what happens is your real estate starts to get less valuable as you go on. So you have a peak here, peak offline, then the price starts to decline because as you see, as demand decreases, price drops. What you see here is this is how much real estate you have to convert into other uses besides retail to keep your price rising at market rate. Now this is disruptive. 
So basically, a company from Seattle threw a bunch of servers together 30 years ago and is now changing the real estate price in London and other cities around the world. What does this actually look like? Prime will always be around. The Palladium will always be there. Where this is really hitting are non-prime and secondary uses. So basically, anything you can order online where it's not a branded proposition, where you don't want to go into the store, where you're not eating something or touching something or playing with something, that's all going to go online. Uh, this is Tesco. This is their share price. And you can see it's going down. Macy's, another major US retailer, goes up. Financial crisis, they're approaching their value during the financial crisis, yet there's no macro disruption this time. Amazon seems fine. It's doing really, really well. Actually, it just crossed $1,000 a share yesterday, up from, oh, say, two. And if you look at them compared, you can see that actually traditional retail was doing fine right until about 07. And now what's happening, so this is a mall, and you can see down here, the mall had a debt of $143 million, and it was sold for $100. This is a seven-year-old mall in the United States. This is in London, supermarket property right down Loom. And this is in uh, Sweden. This is a new mall. It's a very nice mall. I've actually been there. But they're writing it down as well. And so what you see is in every country, people are starting to take write downs on retail real estate. And this is probably one of the most important price indicators, which is this is the price of a mid-grade commercial retail property bond. So this is what the landlord holds and sells. That's at the bottom of the financial crisis. We're starting to get there now, which means not even real estate investors are interested in acquiring this stuff. So now we've seen the entire chain. Now you're sitting over here with your property. You say, oh, it's real estate. We're going to be fine. Actually, you're not. Because what's happening is the disruption took a while, but it eventually came for you. So basically, the customer value, it filters through the system and eventually hits that holiest of holy assets, real estate. Now, back to the dog wearing pants, here's the answer. That's how a dog wears pants. More importantly, here's the price, and you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, furthermore, if you know AWS, AWS is actually fascinating. They didn't just stop with retail. They just kept going, and they said, well, you know, we got all these servers. How about we sell them in these four ways? So you can have a server. It'll be your server. You can use it all the time. You can have a spot instance if you need it sometimes. You can have it on demand, or you can have a reserved instance. So we're actually going to divide our computing time. The computing we're not using, we're going to sell that. We're, literally everything is for sale. Uh, and this, uh, so AWS went down in February, and it took down everything from Airbnb to Kickstarter and a number of other sites. And you get the comment, wow, it's amazing how much of the internet actually runs on AWS. How did this happen? And this, OK, that was the deep dive into disruption, what disruption looks like. Now this is the fun bit, because this is what we're doing with it, and this is where we're going, and this is the exciting part. So 7th January 2007, that's when it starts to kick off. Wow, that whole thing. What happened on the 7th of January 2007? Oh, the iPhone. So Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, and in the next 10 years, Apple stock shoots through the roof, 30% annual growth for a 30-year-old company over the next 10 years. In 2006, the biggest companies in the world largely were uh, utilities and energy companies. Now they are all data companies with the exception of ExxonMobil. This is a map of global flight paths. So these are all the planes going around. This is Facebook's map of data. And so actually, what's happening is we are moving along with data. So wherever we go, the data is there with us. Whatever we're doing, the data is with us. The connections we're making based on data. Mobile. So this is what happened. We went mobile, and what mobile is, it's individual, it's geolocated, and extensible. So it's tied to you. It's your mobile. You probably don't let many other people use it, if anybody. It's geolocated. It knows where you are in the world, and it's highly accurate. And furthermore, it's extensible. You can add apps. You can download software. You can connect it different ways. The next thing that happened was social. Social adds relationships in real time. So now you're carrying a device with you that's individual, geolocated, extensible, has all your relationships, and operates in real time. Now, what can we do with such a thing? Well, let's focus on the value. So from here, we're not really going to talk about that because that's not the interesting stuff. The interesting stuff is the value. So rated, you can rate things. So this is Amazon reviews. This is Uber reviews. This is your Chinese citizen score. And that's the NHS doctor review. So you can actually rate the world in real time around you. You know, like before, if you bought a product and it sucked, what did you do? You just told your friend. You're like, hey, that product sucks. 
Now you can go online. And so what's happening is this weeding out the marketplace faster and faster and faster and giving us better and better quality results. And the great thing about Uber, you rate the driver, but the driver also rates you. You know, make a mess in the, in the taxi and maybe you won't get a ride next time. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite apps. This is called Vivino, V-I-V-I-N-O. And it's a uh, machine, or it's a uh, computer vision. You point it at a wine list and it tells you the rating of the wine. And so all of a sudden, this is probably one of the first uses of augmented reality, but hey, look at this. We've got a nice 4.4 Pinot Grigio there. It's 40 pounds. That ranks better than the 60 pound or even the 80 pound uh, IGT, right? Uh, and this is amazing. I use this app quite frequently. You take it out, point at a wine list. The interesting thing about this, if you have a wine list, you will start making it compatible with this app. So talk about disruptive pricing. How long do you think these wines are gonna stay like this once you have this? You never had this before. You didn't have access to this information. Uh, and then we went to electric and you know, phones enable all kinds of crazy cool things like drones. Uh, and the thing here is the value. So if you're an independent filmmaker, think about if you wanted an aerial shot, how could you get it before? How much was it for a helicopter or a camera rig? Now you get a drone with a hero cam, probably cost you $1,000 and you can start filming on it. And better yet, you can get drone insurance. So actually you can get real-time drone insurance, insure now, 12 pounds an hour. Before this, what you did for drones was you got a one-year policy, you paid the first month, you paid another month to cancel, and you got it again the next time. Uh, this is everybody's favorite, the Tesla. The interesting thing about the Tesla is that sometimes innovation, people pay more. So a Tesla costs more than a car, and one of the reasons is it actually costs one-third less to run. So in order to fill up a car, you have to, in the UK, you have to fill it up with petrol. It costs about 7p per kilometer. Tesla costs about two. So you pay more up front and you pay less down the line. Uh, the next thing is battery powered. Like this stuff is great because you're taking it everywhere. You take it to concerts, you get amazing photos. You know, you're part of something. Like think of the value of that until it runs out and you end up sitting next to some dude at the airport uh, doing the charging dance, right? Uh, cashless, this is a huge one. Uh, I haven't seen contactless very much here, but contactless in the UK is absolutely amazing. It changes your entire purchasing experience. Uh, delivered, so now this device knows where you are. It tells you what's around. More importantly, it knows where he is and knows what's around him. So you start to get the devices that can parlay these networks. And it's all about value. So Deliveroo is a higher end food delivery business. It delivers from restaurants. So the restaurant doesn't need to have a separate delivery service. Deliveroo will take care of it. And it's basically an Uber for food. Uh, real time, speaking of Uber, uh, Uber is amazing in the sense, normally taxis were priced to an even level. Sometimes you paid too much, sometimes you paid too little. Uber does it real time, it does surge pricing. It's actually a network of taxis. The next one, Hotel Tonight. Hotel Tonight's amazing, and actually, if you're a hotel brand, this should be deeply concerning, because basically, these are the rooms that are available tonight. The hotel sets a minimum price, and Hotel Tonight tries to get the best price. Now, when I travel to a city, I don't really care which hotel chain I stay with. I go to Hotel Tonight, and I say, I want Lux 179, let's do it. Uh, Airbnb, I think, is obvious, but I mean, Airbnb is, uh, amounts to a level of disruption uh, that we, we've never quite seen before, which is you have a house, uh, it's empty, so you monetize it on a trust mechanism. And actually, uh, a lot of people like Airbnbs for the exact reason they don't like hotels, which is you get a kitchen, you don't have people in your face all the time, it's more homey. Uh, I mean, talk about disruption. This is getting to the point where uh, in any kind of disruptive model, when you start to get legislated against, that's when you've made it. When the government says, no, we're going to make a law saying you can't do that, that's when it's really taken effect because that means you're hurting somebody and they're definitely hurting the hotel industry. Uh, next one, Drive Now. This is something in the UK. Uh, it's basically a BMW service where you rent a car per minute and you can kind of drop it off anywhere in the Drive Now zone. So I, for me in Hackney, walk out of my house, get in a Drive Now, drive it over to King's Cross, leave it there, uh, charge me 20p a minute for the time I use it. Uh, you can even find a dog. And this is disruptive in the sense that right before this, there's two polarities. There's you have a dog or you don't have a dog. If you don't have a dog, you never have a dog. And if you have a dog, you always have a dog. Well, this is, you can have a dog sometimes, and the person who owns a dog cannot have a dog sometimes. So it's essentially a sharing service for dogs, which is interesting because previously the price was have dog, don't have dog. Now the price is, well, I want to have a dog sometimes. 
Uh, you can share planes. I mean, this one, I've never used it personally, but it looks quite good. Uh, there's WeChat. The interesting thing about WeChat is WeChat is a full e-commerce interface. So actually, when you're in China, you use WeChat to pay, you use WeChat, you can go to a restaurant, you can order there, and more importantly, you can see all the prices in a flat location. So you can start doing price comparisons on levels you could never do before. Uh, WeWork, you rent offices, uh, or you rent offices by the individual desk, rather than rent an entire office. We live, so now rather than getting your own flat, you get your own room attached to a very nice, refined common area. We race. Uh, so the interesting thing is this isn't a gym membership, this is a class membership. You book it online and people pay here $20 a class. So a gym membership is $60 for the month. This is $20 a class and people go three to four times a week. What's next? This is probably going to be the biggest thing that will disrupt pricing, uh, I would imagine, in my lifetime. If you don't know what that is, you should. It's Bitcoin. Now, this is the Indian rupee to US dollar, and you say, wow, that's crazy. You know, things change. Prices change. What I can buy changes. Uh, this is Bitcoin, and this is Bitcoin in US dollars. This is Bitcoin in Chinese yuan. As China implements capital controls, China is moving to Bitcoin. Now, what this is, is this is a pricing mechanism independent of any central government. So no country controls this, no individual controls this. This is simply the market. And so what we're seeing here is the rise of true market price. This is Ethereum. If you don't know Ethereum, it's going to be the next Bitcoin. Uh, I put this on my Twitter account, but if you want to look at it, if you're a retailer or a brand and you're not accepting Bitcoin, you should really look at who is because you're getting major brands who are starting to take Bitcoin. It's not some fringe thing sitting out of the way anymore. It's actually becoming a currency. Uh, and I will end here. So this is all great, right? This is all amazing. Pricing is amazing. Innovation is amazing. Rise of killer robots are coming. There's actually a very serious point here, which is retail employs a hell of a lot of people around the world. And furthermore, it's one of the first steps into the job market. It's one of the few things uneducated workers can access, do well, and actually have uh, a great work experience where they're protected and they're paid. This is McDonald's. They've replaced the whole front of the house in some stores with machines, so they've actually reduced the number of employees at McDonald's by half. Now you have the Momentum Burger robot in San Francisco that will make you a custom-made burger with no human interaction. And what's happening now, all this innovation is great if you are the consumer, but we have a lot of people to worry about in society, and you see that as all this innovation comes, high-wage people are doing well, the working class is doing all right, and the lower class uh, is struggling, and then because of that, in my opinion, you get this, right? So as, and I mean, that's great, it's him holding a picture of himself. But the point here is, as all this innovation comes through, it's great for the consumer. The things we buy are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. However, we're also dealing with social costs because as it gets cheaper, it's getting cheaper for a reason. And finally, it's Project X, real-time property pricing. Basically, uh, this is what I find amazing. This is out the window, and the luxury mall is there. Um, and so this is the Airbnb pricing model. This is uh, algorithmic pricing, and basically what it does is it prices everything within a grid, saying these are micro-neighborhoods. Uh, Project X is about doing the same thing for London and valuing real estate in real time. That's the address. Thank you very much.